It's the Jesus and Paula Show. Starring Jesus Christ and Paula Price. Tune in as we learn the mind of Christ and thoughts of God. Well, good evening, and we're live. We're back in the studio with the Jesus and Paula Show. How's everybody doing? Yes, last week was the TPTI, the Tulsa, the, the Tulsa Prophetic Training Institute. What just happened to my life? Where did we just go? My God Today event that we had right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the embassy. You talk about something for so long and then it actually happens and you're like, it happened to us and through us. And so God showed up in a mighty, mighty way. Next week, I'll have a recap video. You know, I'm all about videos. A recap video of what you missed because you weren't here or what you saw because you were here. Registration is already open and available for the Apostolic Summit, November 16th through the 19th. 16th through the 19th, also at the embassy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You don't want to miss it. If you have time to plan, work out your transportation, and get thyself here. I'm telling you, it, it's very different when you're at an event with a general who, somebody's alarm is going off, with a general who has been a trailblazer in that particular mantle versus a general who is has not been. And so to be here with someone like a Dr. Paula Price, and then to have the lineup of speakers that we have, uh, Prophet Elizabeth Tayyamfuk, this is her second year being with us, and she was raised up and is still with Bishop Bill Hammond. Well, if you know anything about Bishop Hammond, then you understand that he is pretty much considered the father of establishing modern prophetics, contemporary prophetics, reestablishing. He's the one who really paid the price, bore the heat of the day on his own back for bringing credibility to the office of the prophet and prophesying. Uh, whenever and to hear, we got we had the opportunity, myself, Prophet Tala, and Prophet Tamira in 2017, in December of 2017, we had the opportunity to sit at the feet of Bishop Hammond in a small group. There was maybe about maybe 20, 25 people in the meeting and just hear him tell his journey and speak those wisdom nuggets. People like him, like Dr. Price, when they open their mouth, you shut yours. Can we talk about etiquette and divine protocol and order in the kingdom? When giants open their mouth, you shut yours. That's not the time to prove what God told you to, unless they ask you. That's not the time to assert yourself and share every vision and dream and wind of doctrine that has blown through your spirit and your prayer closet in the last six months. That's not the time to grandstand because you're in front of greatness and you want to make sure that they know who you are. Because let me tell you something, if you're really called the way God said, you will be a David where Samuel came and he wasn't even in the room. They didn't even consider him. And what did the man of God say? Nope, none of these are it. Is there not somebody else? So when you're the chosen one, you do not create your own platform. When you're chosen and when it's your time. Because it can't just be chosen. I'm chosen. I have a call. We are all called. We all have a calling. But many called, few chosen. And so we we act, we act really talk about that. Like it's saying many are called, few show up. We kind of blend many called, few chosen with the laborers are few. Like there's plenty of work and few people show up. Isn't that how we kind of blend that whole, those two, we conflate those two ideas together that many call few chosen is the same as the, the work is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And that's, those are two completely different thoughts altogether in scripture. And so whenever you are called and chosen, you, the, the moment of your acknowledgement is rarely the moment of your appointment and ascension. David was anointed 
almost 20 years before he was appointed. And then once he was appointed, it took a minute for the whole kingdom to come together under his rulership. These things did not happen overnight. And we want that the night that the preacher comes in with their hot breath in your face. You know, I talked about this at the event, okay? With their hot breath in your face. And when they sling oil, we want that to be the totality of readiness, the totality of equipping, the totality of what you're going to do is in that moment. Well, I was anointed and you got wet with oil. Anointing does not equate to readying. Anointing, being anointed by a person does not automatically fast track you. David was not fast tracked to the throne because Samuel, who was, there was no higher authority in the land who could anoint him as king. He, his anointing of him recognized in heaven and on earth who he was. It let David know who he was. It let his brothers know. It let the heavenly host know this is God's chosen. <clears throat> and Samuel went back to work. There was no grandiose moment at that time. And his, and his choosing was not the huge ceremony. You know, we made a major change in our organization with our induction ceremony. Inductions used to be very big. It used to be very grandiose. It was in public. Uh, we were, you know, commissioned and, you know, the inductees and it was this whole ceremonial thing. Well, we stopped doing that several years ago because too many people quit. So we pulled all of the grandeur out of inductions and now it's in the chapel in a quiet room now people are welcome to attend friends family the other prophets and apostles in training all the headship is there the people that you're accountable to are there but the people that you will minister to are not and so we separated that out. We also made another change and we st uh, stopped uh, uh, saying, you know, AIT and PIT is an official thing, apostle and training, prophet and training, because quite honestly, you don't get a title until you get an office. Now, your, your higher official, cadet, you know, they're going to call you by your grunt title. This is, is this, can we say this? They do that. But in general, the public does not acknowledge you as a trainee. What's to acknowledge? You haven't done anything. I was called AIT. This is, a, this is how this started. Because when we were trainees, there was no PIT. Well, when we were trained, there was no AIT, period. That, the apostleship training. Oh, hold on. Let me get myself together. The apostleship, thank you. The apostleship training uh, did not exist at that time. And so we were, it was Tala. Ashley and whoever else was in our class because we actually started out with a very big class and ended up ordaining four and then three stayed the course and now two of us are still here and so in that time there was no IT you know Dr. Price would say you know being a PIT is the pit <laughs> being a prophet in training is the pits and we laughed ha 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 but there was no title then we cried <laughs> but then there was no title actually official title so when I was in my apostleship training I was with a class of apostles who were already apostles and I was the only one who was a prophet that was an apostle in training everybody else was an apostle that was already an apostle in training so apostle Holt started calling me AIT like I was the only one in training that's fine AIT. If you know Apostle Holt, you can hear AIT. AIT. So that's how the AIT thing started. And then it just rolled over and was picked up socially. This is why we really do have to be careful what we set in motion. Sometimes you don't realize what you're doing, you're just doing that. So now we have pulled back on that as well. We're not uh, formally and publicly recognizing trainees with a trainee title as far as how everybody else needs to acknowledge because you need to actually earn your title. And so coming into and being inducted, so David was inducted in secret. They weren't calling him king in training. Hey, K-I-T. Hey, Prophet Angel, how you doing? Good to see you. Hey, K hey Kit. How you doing? No, no, no. He knew he wasn't training because then he had to fight a giant. <laughs> he had to war for that. He had to fight for his seat. He was on the run. 
and everything else looked contrary to his anointing to become king. You can tell we do not teach people the way it is written. Everything, come on, Joseph, everything looked contrary to the word of God concerning his life. The reason we get these powerful prophecies, these impacting words, is because when hell is let loose on us, we have to remember, stay in the game. Because there's a word on your life. And if you just make it through these trials and tests, however long they are, you will be the fulfillment of whatever the promises that God gave you. David, it was kingship. Joseph, also rulership. You're talking about these are two guys who were all out of the uh, cultural order of succession. The youngest doesn't get anything, basically. As far as that goes, the younger ones, that's not how that worked back then and even still today. And in many families today, for example, many people think it's their sons that are the ones that are going to inherit. I can't even tell you how many leaders I hear that talk about their sons being the successor and their daughters are meant to birth successors. So your daughter's only good to have babies, hopefully sons. Because it seems that's all you want to recognize to rule the nation. But if we examine scripture closely and honestly, we will see that women have always been pivotal in major saving of nations. That hasn't changed. That and not just the, you know, the top three or five that we want to acknowledge. There's other women that are mentioned throughout scripture that we skip over, skip over, skip over, skip over. We just say Miriam was, was Moses' sister. That's it not the head of the nation with him. We don't even acknowledge. And so you could tell that our cultural training. So you get that powerful prophecy or with Joseph, God spoke to him in a dream and powerful dreams and visions and the whole world, you know, bowing down in the family and whatnot and everything else. And then everything in life was trying to, what was, was it trying to make that word look like a lie or Was that what it takes to turn Joseph into the fulfillment of that word? Was everything that happened to David trying to make God's word look like a lie? Or was that the only pathway to greatness that would turn him from a shepherd boy to a king? It is easy. She said, ring that bell. It is easy to assign warfare to the devil, isn't it? It is easy. But let's go back to military and boot camp. Talk about God called me to be a general. He called me to be a high official, to be a whatever. You sign up in boot camp, somebody starts yelling in your face, day one. You haven't gotten off the bus yet, day one, yelling in your face. Are we saying that Satan is trying to intimidate you through people? To get you out of your place? Or does the military understand this is the only way to prove your officer worthy? Officer equipped. Does somebody yelling in your face cause you to pick up your stuff and go home? Or does it motivate you to double down and say, hold on, let me get myself together because this is what I signed up for. See, all of this is the conditioning training. It's the vetting training. And we really do want, because of poor theological training, I'll say poor theological training because you hear it everywhere, that any type of opposition is straight from hell with that bypasses God. And to where it's, he's like, oh, how did that get through? I mean, this is how we treat the Lord. Now, how did that get through? Now, how did this happen? God promises and don't even get a word about you being wealthy. My God, I hope you understand that you are going to go through financially, come on, Ms. Bankable, in the room, all right? If you're going to be ruling the realm of wealth, that means every opposition of the realm is coming after you because you have got to defeat it. What did we learn at TPTI? I'm sorry if you weren't here, but we learned you have got to defeat what you must rule, period. End of story. That is a hard pill to swallow for the American Christian who was raised in the evangelical church because we were raised the opposite is true. Now, Scripture says that. I mean, we're talking about with the serpent in the garden to the devil in the wilderness with Jesus. 
and everything in between and after tempting, sifting, sorting. We talked about this in youth group last night with Peter. Everything that Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. And that sifting is the testing. Sometimes we're in denial about what's on the inside of us. Are we not? Peter, I would, Lord, Lord, come on, man. I'm going to ride over a cliff with you. You're my ride or die. Listen, man, you're going to you're deny me. You're going to deny you even know me before the weekend is out. No, far be from, no, Lord. No, no, no. Just denial. Just that quick. Because when favor was turned and when people got afraid, genuinely, you thinking, are they going to crucify us with Jesus? See, this is when the real test happened. If I say I know him, are they going to turn me in? Because we'll say, I wouldn't deny Jesus. Really, people denying Jesus all the time. Won't walk off a job for the Lord. Denial. Won't leave your family for the Lord. Denial. Won't volunteer in the house of God. Denial. We deny Jesus all the time. Bump up your tithes and offering. Won't do it. Denial. We deny the Lord all of the time. I need you to go minister to this person. Mm, I'm tired. Denial. I want you to volunteer to give this person a ride around because they don't have a car. I don't want to do it. Denial. How many times in scripture? And, and we know because even of the examples and parables that Jesus gave, but whenever you minister to the least of these, you've ministered unto me. So we deny Christ all the time. It may not be in public and we might not be the people who say who deny our salvation. But we will reject our Lord. Just like we reject people. We do it. And so these tests and these trials are meant to not just prove us, but to groom us for what the Lord has caused, called us and caused us to ultimately rule or dominate. It could be something national. It could be something local. It could be something personal. It really doesn't matter. The testing could be and are you going to be diligent in this little thing here? So we can give you this big thing over here. Again, when we study scripture, you have the man with the one talent and the this and the that, the one city all the way up to 10. And in the end, God gave the one to who? The guy with the most, not the least. He didn't say, well, I want to be fair. Did he, Prophet Andrew? He didn't say, I want to be fair. I don't want this one to feel like they've been left out. So, I mean, this guy already has 10. I don't want to give him 11 because then I might look like I'm unjust. He's like, give it to the one already ruling everything. I know they'll be able to take care of this. You see how we see things versus how God sees them? We care about people's feelings way too much. Now, I'm not talking about being all, you know, hard and abrasive and somebody's having a breakdown. Well, pull yourself up by your boots. I'm not talking about heartless. This is why we have the fruit of the spirit. Gentleness, kindness. So there's provision to have a heart. Is there. That is the evidence of Christ when you can love people, not just the ones who are easy to love. Having joy, having peace. Do you carry peace or do you carry division? You can look at what you walk in by what shows up everywhere you go. Don't deny it. Just own it. Well, I didn't mean to, but you did. Don't, don't say what you didn't mean to do. That's the fastest way to be locked into a lie within yourself. You don't take ownership. Now you can, of course, I didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't realize this was going to happen. I didn't know. So I repent. I, whatever, please forgive me. And this is what I'm going to do to change it. But in that readiness process, every, and if you have a high call, every aspect of your character will be challenged. Every aspect will be exposed. And the closer you get to your seat of authority, the more pressure you're going to feel, the more that thing is going to squeeze in on you. We have our trainees. We have several. Actually, we have quite a few trainees in the room right now in the studio. The closer they get to ordination, the closer they get to commissioning, that's when you're going to feel that squeeze. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Your emotions are going to be taxed. Your mind is going to be taxed. Your attitude is always going to be tested. And, and your, your fortitude, your durability, all of that is going to be tested because when you get in the seat of rulership, no more wiggle room. Somebody just had to shout out in the room. They know it's real. No more wiggle room. No more excuses. No more retreating into yourself. You are now owned by the kingdom. 
This is why a lot of people don't want to be leaders. How many people say they don't take promotions on their job because they don't want to be the one called whenever something goes sideways? Now, you're going to cry about your salary, cry about not having the benefits you want, whine about all the things, but will not take the position that can empower you to change how things are done on the job because you don't want the responsibility of the change. You just want the benefits of the change. See, this is gift versus office. The gift wants the benefits of the change. The officer wants to be the one to make the change and be responsible for the change. You know, genuine leaders actually love responsibility. If you can't stand responsibility, get out of the race now. If you do not like people calling your name, get out of the race now. If you do not want to be the one that gets the calls late at night, in the middle of the night, when something has gone wrong, get out of the race now. If you conveniently can never be found when the office is calling you, literally get out of the race now. See, we, we are now tracking all these things in our organization. How available you make yourself. I know people who have two jobs, and you know what? They got that phone slid in the side somewhere. Listen, I'm going to be at work, but you know what? You can just, okay, email me. They're going to see to it that we can reach them some kind of way. Or say, I'm available between this time and this time. So if you need me, you can leave a message. I'll get back to you between this time and this time. Very accountable. That's your officer mentality. Always on alert. Officer mentality. Gift mentality is constantly saying, nobody told me. The officer is saying, I need to go find out because I haven't heard. Officer mentality is, you know what? We have an event. I'm just using the event because we have one, not because this happened. It did not. I am not subtly talking about a situation that happened, okay? But, you know, we have an event, and there are things we do every year. There's meetings we have every year, routines that we have. Oh, you know what? I'll use uh, the profits training. All right, I'll use the profit angels in the room. Every single event, profit angela sends out the email is the packet is the assignment is the schedule it's the speakers it's their bios all the all these things that happen now let's say i did not receive that at some point or at least i didn't notice that i hadn't received it the uh, the gift mentality now i administrate the whole event so i you know insert schedules in various places and whatever gift mentality is huh well i guess they're not doing it yeah right <laughs> The office mentality is, hey, Prophet Angela, did you send that schedule? Because I usually have that by now. I did. Oh, you did. Hold on. Let me go check. Yep. There it is sitting in my inbox unopened. You sure did. Thank you very much. In fact, when you can count on somebody's faithfulness, you know what I'll do? I will check my email first. I probably missed this two months ago. And there it is. <laughs> because when you are faithful, this, this event, prayer, okay, first day of prayer. I have an alarm that I use for events. The phone does, doesn't update, and then uh, some things were reset. So it was reset to, like, silent alarm. Who does a silent alarm? Either it's an alarm or it's silent, okay? And so Prophet Norma is in my house in the morning because she is getting Dr. Price ready. Prayer's at 6 o'clock. I don't miss prayer. I do not miss prayer. And so she's knocking on my door. Apostle Ashley, are you intending to be home right now? See? And I opened my eyes and I was like, I could see sunlight. I said, yeah, I'm late. I said, what time is it? It's 635. Ah! No. Boom. You pop up by the bed. Your head is pounding because then you're like in a pit. Where am I? What is going on? And so because I never miss. And I live with Dr. Price and work with her. Anybody I talked to said, well, I thought you were with Dr. Price. Because you don't miss. It didn't cross anybody's mind that I was in a coma. When you are reliable in your job, people do not assume you've missed the mark. Even when you do. Get first office. When you're in office, you have got to be on point all the time. And even when you're not, that, that first round is a grace period. Oh, yeah. And so she had texted at, at, at first and there was no response. And then she called. She's like, Apostle? I think you left a message. Did I catch the call? I don't think I caught the call. 
Did I, okay, listen, I was still, my mind was all over the place. I don't even remember talking. And I was like, hello, I'm coming. I'm late. <laughs> She's like, I was just calling because my mom said, when you didn't get up on that microphone to do the morning announcement, she said, where is my daughter? She calls me, where are you? Now, mama is going to be like, where are you? What's your problem? What's the problem? And so, <laughs> but that is the exception. See, you need to be so tight that when you miss, it's the exception to the rule that people don't presume. Well, you know, Apostle Ashley, well, we just kind of already planned on her missing. Oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't there. Oh, we already had a backup plan. See, when people already have a backup plan for you, that means you're not on it. You're not on it. Well, we know so-and-so is, yeah, well, we know how they, okay, mm -hmm, watch this. Let me try and right. And so the whole, all, the journey up until is the readiness. So don't think and attribute hardship to demonic warfare. Hardship is readiness training for a hard call. It's a hard call. It's a hard job. Police officer, hard job. Law enforcement in general, hard job. Every day you go out expecting somebody to attack you and thankful when they don't. Not in shock. Oh, my goodness, somebody pulled a weapon. Can you believe they robbed that store? Can you imagine it like the break room? In the precinct, in the headquarters, it just can you can you believe that guy actually tried to rob a store? And, and these are police officers in shock at criminals, like that that they're actually attempting. Now you could talk about can you believe this fool thought they were going to get away with it? But I mean, oh my! And they stole a car. Can you believe somebody stole ten cars today in Tulsa? That's just crazy. Law enforcement officers don't think like that. In fact, when the statistics and the crime goes down, it's like, huh, this is good. We need to find out what else is going on somewhere. When things look too quiet and too peaceful, if you're somebody who does not want to have to enforce whenever things look quiet and peaceful, you're so happy, you don't even investigate. You don't check and see if something else is going on. But the trials are meant to try you, to try you out, to take you out for a ride. Let's take this mantle out for a test drive. Let's throw them into a situation to see how they handle it. That's test driving your mantle. Before you're there. So if you're a prophet in training, apostle in training, teacher in training, minister in training, if you're in training anywhere, just understand that the Lord is going to take you out for a test drive in your training to see how well you do. Let's see. Let's open it up. Don't we go? Come on. You get on the highway and you open that engine up. You put your foot all the way to the floor and pray to God. You don't see, you know, Rachel's husband <laughs> out there <laughs> pulling you over. What are you doing? All right. You take anything out before like, before you buy a car, you take it out for a test drive. It doesn't matter how cool it looks. Oh, the interior, the leather, it's all smooth. Everybody knows get on the highway and hit that gas for an extended period of time to see, is it choking? Is it coughing? Is it hesitating? Is it struggling? Is it, or whenever you're getting on the highway, and you're merging onto oncoming, oncoming traffic. Are you saying a prayer because you can make it? You're like, oh, Lord, oh, no. See, and this is what God has to do with us in our mantles. He has to take us for a test drive. That's training is your test drive series. Well, let's take them out. Let's throw them in this situation unprepared and see how they do. Let's see if they remember what they just learned last semester in school. Let's see how they, let's see if they even remember they were in school last year. And he takes you out and throws you on the highway of your calling. And he's like, well, you better step on the gas or you're going to get run over, <laughs> doesn't he? You better come on here. And all of a sudden, you know, when a car is moving fast, that handle can get you're like, whoop. And it, OK, so does your mantle get out of your control? Is it running you? Are you running it? And so many times we'll attribute a test drive from the Holy Ghost as the devil. And he's like, no, no, I'm driving this trial. I'm driving this here. I'm driving this here. I'm driving this test drive. I am driving you to the brink of you. Only for you to hopefully discover, oh, that's not the end of me. I thought it was. You know, you look at one road, it looks like it ends and it just has a tight turn. <laughs> yes. And so you're going to, he's going to put that gas down on those emotions. Put that gas down on, the, put that gas down on having to do homework and everything else while you're having three jobs and all right. And five kids and Lord don't have a family on top of it all. Bless the name of Jesus. Don't have a family on top of it all. Because then when you come home, you have people calling your name, demanding that you do things before you get to 
the assignments. And so he'll test drive you. Woo, he will test drive you around. He'll say, let's do one more lap. <laughs> you see the parking lot coming, you're like, oh, praise God. He's like, you know what, let's go this way. You're like, no. Don't you want to call on prophet so-and-so in training? Don't you want to call on AIT so-and-so in training? Don't you want to call it and you don't, you don't want to tell God, you do not want to get in the habit of telling God you prefer he calls somebody else instead of you. Because then he will stop calling you. And then what happens to your calling? You have a calling because he calls you. <laughs> Hello, by name. He calls you by name. Samuel. He called by name. He called people by name. Do you do not want to get in the habit of telling the Lord to stop calling you for assignments? In fact, you don't want to get in that at all. Yes, Lord, your servant is listening, and I thank you for your strength right now to execute what you're about to give me to do. And not just because you're programmed to say the right words. Well, you know... It's interesting that you're bringing that up. I'll be doing a teaching on it. We often teach about capacity, mm -hmm. you know, and most of us know about capacity. We understand somewhat of a capacitator, okay, uh, or capacitor from the Back to the Future things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with Michael oh, yeah, yeah. J. Fox. Yeah. You know, oh, we yeah. need this yeah. flux capacitator. Yeah. And so, you You're know, cool, Dr. Pryor. I am. You're I'm, cool. a, I'm also you, over 20. You are. Say they both, because half of these young people don't even know that. But, you know, the flux capacitator. I mean, that one, and the entire movies and the series of the movies were chasing down this capacitator. <laughs> so the Holy Ghost woke me up. Because, see, God's even cooler. Because he's like, see, God's never the past because he's always the present. He's never the present because he's always the past. And he's never the past or the present because he's the future. His future has been resolved. And it's re and now he's working his past in our future. See, God is working his past in our future. And so he woke me up. He said, I'm going to teach you about the soul's capacitance. Well, I've never heard the phrase capacitance. And, you know, I'm writing my soul book pretty soon. You all are going to invite, be invited to uh, attend my soul class so that I can teach my book and work my book out with people. If you're interested, make sure that's somebody who's happy. And uh, if you're interested, just just text uh, however way they do it. I don't know how they do it. Y'all do it. But they'll tell you. Rachel will tell you. So you will say, I want to enroll in Dr. Price's exclusive on class on soul, on the soul. Soulology, soulism, soulicalism. You're going to learn about the soul. Because what we have done is what I want to do is produce soulologists that can solve the soul's issues because that's what goes to heaven or hell so your soul determines your afterlife if you're taking notes right now your soul determines your afterlife so the class will not be free do not cry to me about i really think that god wants me to take it i just don't have any money so let me tell you about god god is the first one who said faith without works is dead and god is first one who said buy the truth yes and sell it not by wisdom. And so you understand that God does not expect his knowledge to be free. Only those who don't know how God operates will give it away for free. Because, you know, people who don't have to earn things are always going to have to be the ones to give it away. Indeed. You know, because the people who have to, um, they understand investment. They also understand mm -hmm. that the harvest on zero is zero. So we're going to start those classes within a week. Because the textbook is almost done. You are not getting the textbook. Yay! You'll get excerpts and handouts. Woohoo! Because the textbook is going to be the book that's getting published. And so you all are going to learn, if you want, about the soul the way the maker made it. So here's the name of the class The Soul the Way the Maker Made It. I'm going to tell you again The Soul the way the maker made it. That is the name of the course. That's the, gen the, the overarching name. You are welcome to enroll in the course. It is a credentialable course. If you are a 
uh, counselor, psychologist, or therapist, and I got, I've got several in my church, some good ones, and you've had training, you will appreciate the correlations, contradictions, contrasts, and comparisons. But it's the soul, the way the maker made it. And you'll sign up online and you're not going to inbox me on Facebook and tell me that, you know, God wants you to take it, but he didn't give you the money. Thank you. Because you've gotten so much for free, you don't respect anything a man has. Mm -hmm. We've given you so much that for nothing, for just because you got saved, just because you said the sinner's prayer, you don't realize that you, what you get for free, you don't find as useful as what you invest in. Half of you all, you got those degrees. Nobody can tell you that, hey, wait, I, I, I worked for this. I stayed up X amount of hours. I had to give up this. I had to give up that. So you're going to have to give up a few things. And, it, and I am okay with that. You understand? Because I pay for my mastery and I pay for my expertise. Yeah. And you're going to hear the soul the way the maker made it. And it's not going to be full of scripture chants and quotes. And, and that's we're not doing that. This is analytical. It's scientific. It's biotic. It is involved. And you're going to know how to do it and what it means for you to handle the soul the way the maker made it. You'll find out the shortfalls of all the other religious approaches. You know, like right now, we have a lot of Asiatic or Asianism in the uh, in, in the soul realm because, you know, devils think that they made the soul. They think they, they only corrupted it. And so the corrupter is trying to fix the corruption. That's really funny. And so. Um, so you're going to learn it. If you want to do it, you are welcome to do it. You can enroll week by week. If it's, we'll make it affordable. You pay your tuition up front, you get access to the class. You don't pay, you don't get access. And it won't recycle again. So if you, or if you want a package deal, I'm sure that my illustrious team will come up with some sort of package deal. This is information that has not been out there. You will not find it anywhere else. But those of you who know me know I, I study my stuff. I look at it. I look at the things that were thrown away. For example, most people don't know that much of psychology today is about squashing Jesus Christ, getting the maker's codes, the maker's um, uh, inputs and connection out of your soul so they can put all the mother 40, 40 million gods. I, I, I mean, I'm not impressed with the Asiatic faiths and religions because it takes too many gods to get one thing done. You know, how many yeah. people does it take to change a light bulb? Right. Yeah. Indeed. How many idiots does it take to mow a lawn? So uh, it yeah. takes too many gods for them to get anything done. We are the superlative uh, model because we only need, our God has all things. So fragmentation didn't happen to the Holy Ghost. He distributed. He disseminated. He did not fracture and fragment. So you're going to talk about that. We're going to have a blast. So getting back to capacitance, because I know you thought I forgot. Now, capacity is the ability or the capacity or the, the height, width, depth, length to hold something. So capacity is about holding something. You know, your container, containment and enclosure, but capacitance is about that ability extending to being able to tolerate and accommodate power, electricity, and energy. So capacitance in God's mind is huge because it talks about why, why I can endure this and you can't even tolerate that. And yet you, we both have a soul. So it has to do with the measures and it has to do with the depths and the length and all of that of the soul and its ability to handle power and to accommodate power and to be the receptacle that distributes it at various levels and degrees of intensity. Is that powerful? Yeah. So the best example is your car battery. You can put a, a car battery in a car based on its capacitance, right. its ability to handle all of the current, all of the flows, all of the issues, all of the demands, all right? But to put a car bar battery in a semi, oh. if you could, 
or take a semi's battery and shrink it to that to maximum of what a car can do. So a lot of souls don't have the capacitance for the prophetic. So we have a different capacitance. We have the capacity to handle various diversity. That's why when, when my students whine and cry, first of all, they don't even want me to hear them whine or cry. They'll say, don't tell Dr. Price. Don't let Dr. Price know. Because I'm coming after that capacitance. So that's why the capacitance of a prophesier is not the same as the capacitance of a prophet. One with the prophet spirit. Wow. Your spirit determines your capacitance among a bunch of other things. So you, so the fact that you are always telling God what you can't do doesn't help your cause. He doesn't look at you and say, oh, poor baby. Evangelicals will say, oh, poor baby. Charismatics, oh, poor, poor. And, and, you know, the word of faith, well, you do what you can do, although they're pretty tough. Yeah. You know, most of them are, all three of them are, but, but, but this late generation, because yeah. the early ones were giants, that's how they became yeah. giants. Yeah. They upped their capacitance. They kept upping their capacitance. So your, and your capacitance could be affected by a number of things. In the soul class, we're going to talk about your mitochondria and how it plays into that prophetic realm. We're going to talk about your epigenetics and how Mary's epigenetics caused Jesus' soul to die. So you don't know that. And so we're going to talk about a lot of those things. So this is going to be very academic. Don't talk to me about academia because prophets will introduce academia to the world. Prophets, in, 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 see, I know you thought the devils did. No, they did not. Devils introduce mania. Prophets introduce academia or academia, depending on your language. So, so you're going to learn that because you cannot build something that you don't have the blueprint for. You cannot build a prophet if you don't have a prophet's blueprint. You don't have the archetype. You're trying to make a prototype without an archetype. And prototypes come from our side. So we're going to upgrade the, pro the prophetic. We're going to, because God starts everything with a prophet, then we need to upgrade that starter. So your starter kit and your starter program is not going to be what you thought it was. It's not going to go that way. So I don't care what school you come from. I don't care what your camp is. I don't care what your what pred prophetic predigree, where everybody's going to start at the same place. Because it's the soul that God deposited on earth in Adam. Neither the spirit nor the soul were created on the planet. We need to stop. See, all of those pagan things are about what the dirt produces. Or the angels, the asexual angels, those without re reproductive ability or capacity, those without the blueprint from the Almighty are given credit with human creation from dust, stardust, angel dust. Because they, in some way, they know that the, the human was not created on the planet. They just can't reconcile it with the story or the account that the scripture has. They have got to say they're God's. If you listen to most of their stories, all of their deities um, and their gods, most of them, I'll say I'm all but one or two, all of them had wives that reproduce baby gods and godlings. Jesus did it without, without intercourse, sexual reproduction. Yeah. He did it differently. You're going to find out. He also blew the soul of humanity into the nostrils of his one being. He only made one, Adam. He didn't even, you know, when he started and blew the breath of life in, Eve did not exist. She came with the rest of the crowd. So these are things that you should know because you cannot fight for what you don't comprehend. I need, I really need you to appreciate that. So you are welcome. Come one, come all. We will grade and there will be homework. You don't do homework, I will cut you. Because you have to practice what you learn in order to know that you've learned it. And so I will cut you. So this is not, don't ask me about auditing. I don't, I don't want to do, not, anybody, listen. Don't ask me about auditing.
This is a producers, performers, actionizers, uh, actionizers program. If you don't intend to do anything with it, then don't sit and listen to it. We're not having sit-ins, listen-ins, and all of that. That's not happening. Now, I know that there are integrity issues and some of your friends are going to just whatever, but it will profit you nothing. Because when Israel tried to get the manna the wrong way, it turned to worms. There was only one way to get your manna. That was Moses' way. Only one way to get your manna from heaven, Moses' way. So we're going to have these classes. It'll be about a, maybe a couple of weeks because, you know, I try to give them a, a breath sometimes. But what I love, many of you don't know, I have a crack team. And when I say that, my team loves a challenge, even though they are, know it's going to drain them dry. <laughs> See? That, Prophet Ed, It's going to do it. Why? Because they know God has told us we have a short window to make some magnificent things happen to get the team, the next guard ready to go. So this is this is not passive. This is not, um, uh, you know, professional learners. Uh, they're professional students. No, I don't want those. I want those that God is calling to the next level. And you must have the mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it was not what? Robbery to do what? It's important that you hear this. So if you want to do it, I'm, I'm sure periodically uh, Rachel is going to have it on the screen so you can catch it. It'll be there more than enough time. You'll find out what the enrollment part is. And it will be challenging because what the future holds for God's people is challenging. It's threatening. And if we don't rage up the right guards for it, they won't do it. We, uh, we have our dunamite drills where there's going to be a part of it so that you, I see it. Um, I'll grab a hold of it just because I can do it. All right. We have our my drills. And if, if you want to get a sense of what it's going to be like, purchase the dunamite drills. I understand that Cody, yeah. one of our youngsters, ran, I mean, ran down the dunamite drills because we teach them to our kids because we wait too late to teach people oh. how to survive Jesus, let alone survive his creation. Oh. Because, see, you know, you got to survive Jesus. I know that people think that he's a honey man, teddy bear. No, no, no. That's your portrait. That's not the person. So you can do anything you want with a portrait. Put it on this wall. Take it down. Put it over here. So uh, you need to recognize that the man, Christ Jesus, had a mind. The mind of his father, the mind of the keeper, the entirety of the scriptures is the mind of Christ. And every utterance is the thoughts of God. From Genesis to Revelation, Revelation from in the beginning, God to the spirit and the bride say, come, it's all Jesus, for he is the word, the logos. We're going to find out what that is, because it's not just rhetorical prophecy or rhetorical prediction. See, rhema is the root of the word rhetorical. So when you gave a rhema word, it was not necessarily even spiritual. We, we called it that, but it wasn't spiritual. Because it was all about the internal discourse of the speaker. Orations come from rhema. Oratories come from rhema. That's very different than logos, which is logic. That's why so many rhema words seem illogical to the point that today people feel like anything somebody classifies as prophetic is in fact prophetic even if it's illogical. Rhema does not have to be logical. It can be philosophical. It can be ideological. You can name it like that. But Logos has got to bring the logic of intelligence to the public life or world, to your hearer. So we're going to talk about that. So again, we're, what are we going to have? What is the name of the class? The soul, the, way the, maker made it. the soul, the way the maker made it. Because you have yet to deal with the soul. We've got... I can't even tell you countless books on the spirit. Right. And we don't, we have precious few in comparison on the soul. And yet it's your soul that goes to hell. It is your soul that got corrupt. It is your soul that was taken over. And so we're, we, we talk about that and there'll be a lot of correlation 
with as well as fodder for our biblical psychology class. We do have a bib side and it's going to tie in and my bib side teachers and and curriculum developers are going to love me teaching the soul. So rather than, you know, I've been trying to race to get this done and Holy Ghost said, but you still have to seed people's minds for it. So I'm going to seed your mind for the series of books that I am doing on the soul as the maker made it the soul as the maker made it so don't tell me about what your academics did i don't want to hear about what your university said because we understand that the majority of those are not based on the soul as the maker made it but on the soul as the devil devastated it but this version is not what god blew into adam the soul that's passed on through his seed is not the soul that God blew into Adam. That soul was killed by the fruit of the tree that was eaten so as not to lose a woman. That is why sexuality figures so high in demonism. So you're going to love us talk about the soul as the maker made it and then my prophets will take and do me a lovely um, favor as well as my apostles and extract from that general teaching what actually is important to the prophet's mantle, the prophet's sphere of domain, the apostle's sphere of domain. You know, I have my apostle of the future, so she's going to have to work like I don't even know. But then she does. She does. These people work. And they work because we have a short window to produce a product that and we have a short window to produce and disseminate it. So you're going to love your class. They some they will some will be video. Others will be audio. Some will be print. Just to diversify. But I need you to understand. I do not. We, we're inviting anybody who wants to. But you will complete or we will not let you go through. I'm not going to let you sit here and, and just garble up and, gar, you know, eat it up and chew it up and then pass it out as your own. Because, you know, the first thing you need to know is that Satan made souls unethical, immoral, corrupt, profane. That's that's what his spirit did. You're going to love learning this because you realize that you're going to realize that the devil has a soul. I know you didn't think he did. He has a soul and it went to hell. And it's a resident of hell. As a matter of fact, it was the impetus for hell. We're going to learn that. So, so when we start talking about how God, how the maker heals a soul versus how the maid heals the soul, mm -hmm. M-A-D-E, you're going to see a difference. Isn't that interesting? Yes. What do you think about it? I think if we're going to be successful in this war, we need it. Absolutely. Because the primary point of attack, you don't have to move it. The primary point of attack against us is psychological and soulological warfare. Amen. Chief. I got Chief A and Chief B. I like Chief A and Chief B. Um, I would agree with what was said. I think if we're going to win this war, that is what we'll need to do. We have to master those things in us and master what he mastered about us um, because we were shaped in his iniquity. And I think that, you know, understanding that Satan had a soul really makes sense in terms of what was passed on, mm -hmm. you know, through the epigenetics of Adam, because um, clearly something had to in order for us to pick it up as our own, you know, operation and functionality. So I think that is very necessary for us in this season to do that. Amen. Chief B. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm excited about it because I know I need it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like hey, man. Work with 3D, huh? <laughs> hey, man, for the capacitance, you know, I, I think one way that I would. Hi, hallelujah. Uh, we definitely need that capacitance in order to get into the stratus 
that you're calling us into by identity and to be able to stand in them. And I think a natural parallel that I would make is with sickle cell, when you go into crisis, there are pain levels, right? And when they're attending to you, they'll ask you what pain level that you're at, mm -hmm. right? And I've, I've experienced some pain. There are levels of pain that make you feel like you just want to leave your life, mm -hmm. right? They're just, uh, listen, I just, just took, oh Lord. You know, there are levels of pain that take you there. And when you parallel that to the soul, Satan is a pain master. Yes. Right. And he Ooh. uses the pathology of our pain to bring us to a level where we would commit destiny suicide, identity mm -hmm. suicide, That's because right. the pain is so great. But what you're saying about the capacitance is bringing us into that level where we can override those particular tools and devices and be able to really stand. Mm -hmm. And how about recognizing and identifying them? How about you? Lastly, Apostle Sally, our senior apostle. Yes, I was thinking about what you said. You can't fight what you can't comprehend. So with this type, type of teaching, a lot of things that we haven't been able to comprehend is going to come to light now. We don't get enough teaching on the soul. Like you said, there aren't very many books. I constantly surf to just see if anybody else is teaching it besides Dr. Price. Of course, mm -hmm. I don't find very many people or they've taken your teaching and tried to make it cute. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, I mean, I just, I think now we're going to get the rest of the story. That's what I call it mm -hmm. about the soul that we're so hungry to hear. And we've been wanting to hear it all of our lives, Yeah. but now it's coming in to us. That's excellent. Very, very excellent. It's important. You know, those are our three leaders here, uh, but it's important that we understand the prophet is about the soul. The apostle is about the spirit. And the teacher is about the converted. So you have to understand that. And when you, you know, we use consciousness as if it's something different from the soul, when in fact, consciousness is how we, is, is the, I want to use it, the incense and the fragrance and the smoke, if you will, of the soul. And so, it, because it, it 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 is what. Well, anyway, I don't want to give the class too early, and I don't want to have to break that down right now. So I want you to understand. <laughs> Help me. So I want you to do it, and and so it will start. We'll be starting in a couple of weeks. If I know my team the way I know my team, those are who are in the prophetic program of any way, or probably any program, you will be you will be invited. We will not mandate you do it. If you're in our school, we mandate you do it just for you to know. But I understand. I want you to understand you do get the bonus for doing it. So it's important that you sign up for the soul as the maker made it. Isn't that Jesus? I've been giving you tastes of it. Um, leading up to Prophets Week, you're going to understand why we're going to have, why we will have the Prophecy Clinic, why this is clinical and not just academic. You're going to understand the clinical part of it because this clinical is very important. But to me, the clinical side is going to be the cleaner, the cleanser, because we have to clear clean and cleanse what's 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 been done to you by the world some of this stuff you will be surprised at the connectors that god has given but we are going to do this that's our next dimension we're bringing i'm raising up not just uh potent uh prophesiers or eloquent prophesiers i am raising up those who can face off with through our dunamite drill establishment being the offspring of the godhead we're the offspring of the Godhead. So guess what we ought to be like? The Godhead. Godhead. Isn't that funny? Because we're his children. You know, we are born again by his seed. Now, you, you're going to hear people, I don't believe in that. I First of all, I am not building a ministry around unbelievers. Woo! So y'all need to understand, I'm not mantalizing unbelievers. I am not doing that. I'm not immantling unbelievers. So I don't care about your doubt. I don't care about what you don't believe. That's your thing. Go to the God you believe in. You know, there are a lot of people who are in positions that folks don't believe they should occupy. They do not build a whole campaign around persuading folks that they should be there. See, we're, that's the soul that the makers made. What did Jesus say? He said, well, if you don't believe I'm him, you're dying your sins. 
and he went on moving on moving on I'm here for the faithful, the believers. I don't care if you don't believe today, but you are called before the foundation of the world. You're part of this. If not, you're still called before the foundation of the world not to be part of this. I can't remember. I don't know. Maybe you older ones can remember. Do you remember in the, was it the 80s and the 90s? We had this great big debate about predestination. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I was like. Okay, and then we had predestination, then we had the trip one, trip two, trip in, trip out, no trip, 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 trip over your faith. Trip trips. Okay. All the trips. Trip trips. And so we had that. And people were arguing, and then the unbeliever was saying, Well, I mean, I mean, if God already knows who's gonna be saved, it doesn't make a difference what I do. Yes, it does because salvation has to enter your flesh. See, you have to be saved by your soul. Your soul must be saved. Because it's your soul that tells eternity who to take where when they leave the body. Yeah, but if he already knows who's going to be it, that it doesn't matter what God knows. God also knows that the sun's going to shine tomorrow and that so-and-so is going to happen in a year. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen because he already knows it. See, we don't have logic. That's logos. See, we've got to have the logic of the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when they had this whole discussion, well, I mean, it doesn't make a difference what I do because I'm either going to go to heaven or hell. No, no. Now understand, God knows whether you're going to go to heaven or hell, but hell doesn't know. Earth doesn't know. And your flesh doesn't know. And God also has to do something that we don't give him credit for having to do. And that is God has got to, this I think is so powerful, God has got to prove to all creation that his judgment for sending you to hell is right. So he needs you to act out your unbelief. He needs you to act out your misbehavior. He needs you to act out so that it becomes a matter of creation record that he did not just arbitrarily send you to hell, but that you asked for it and that you sold for it and that you lived for it. You lived up to hell instead of up to heaven. That has to be documented just like your flesh is made documented in the earth. You understand that when you die, your flesh is documented. And if perchance they go to your little grave a hundred years from today, your name is on it of the so-and-so family. And if they perchance have any tissue left over from your living self, they can say that it's documented that you are in that grave. See, I don't play those dumb games. Satan is stupid. Now, he's, 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 he's stupid genius, but he's stupid. Yeah, he's genius in what he does. Come on, he's been doing it forever. He ought to be good. I can imagine God saying, boy, you better sift this for me. So the argument on predestination, stupid. But it's based on text, print, and context, not beings or biotics. Because when you bioticize this, a lot of things make more sense. That's what the prophets were supposed to do. That's what they did. They had to keep showing that they that God had biologically created Israel. Mm. Oh wow. I gotta get a <laughs> hit the mother two, girl. Go orange. Go green. Yeah. So I'm telling you because it's important. Get my hair out my eyes. But it's important that you recognize God did not create Israel with pen and ink. As a matter of fact, he governed them by the Ten Commandments without ink. His finger laser wrote the Ten Commandments in the rock. And it was a long time before we could invent lasers that would do that manually. He did it manually. But Israel was created biologically abraham was given a unique sperm oh my God. called isaac yes. before the foundation of the world and elizabeth was given a very peculiar womb as was mary 
So this has always been biologic. It has always been biotic. And we've been trying to run it on print and paper and ink and text and quotings and, and doctrines and all of that. When in fact, it is biologic. So he was, Abraham was embedded with the consciousness of the almighty. Genesis 18, should I hide from Abraham, Abram, what I'm about to do since he is my friend and he will teach his children, his sons to know me? He didn't say he will teach the walls. He didn't say he would teach the rocks. He did not say that. He said he will teach people. Biotic, biological, neurological, anatomical people. And then when you're an apostle, a real apostle, you understand the difference between the being and the, and the things that the being does. We haven't taught about that. We should have. But we, we, I'm teaching it. You're going to learn about that even in your soul class. Israel was not uh, 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 engraved on stones, and because of what stone graving said, they were they were brought into being. They were not. Even pagans weren't. Cain is a real being who passed on his rejection and his vagabond judgment to his seed. When you look at people with those raggedy jeans and whatnot, just think Cain. Cain was called a vac. That came from the Cain line. That's a vagabond spirit. Wandering spirit. Can't make up your mind whether you want to be dressed or undressed. Whether you want to be covered or uncovered. Whether style should be raggedy and, and frayed or should it be whole and at least sedate. No, we can't do that. That's Cain. The line of Cain is paganism. You need to understand that because we don't hear people teach it a lot. Now, they do. They know. They know they come from Cain because they know they don't come from Jesus. Right. They know that because they don't like him. They can't stand him because they don't have his spirit in him. Jesus said that. He said, but you're of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father, you will do. He sins from the beginning. And he bought not in the truth. He was a murderer from the beginning. So think about it. All of the things that you hate in the world, Jesus had to incarnate to tell you, hey, guys, not me. Not me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't make that. No, no. Those are not the kids I made. The kids I made were st are still in me. Mm -hmm. When Pentecost comes, you'll meet my seed. Mm -hmm. And so we, I mean, we prophets ought to be able to talk like that instead of saying, God loves you and me too. God loves whatever God loves, but what he doesn't love is sin. What he doesn't love is death, murder, and unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't love is the Lucifer that became the old dragon, that old serpent, the dragon and Satan. That is God is what does not waste his love on the dead and the doomed. We need to stop saying that he doesn't waste his love on that. He wastes his love on that which was in him before the foundation of the world. You can only get saved if you were in Christ before the foundation of the world. But you've got you've got to stay saved before, or you're going to be kicked out of Christ. See, we, we, we told you a lie, but John 15 said, I am the what? I'm the vine. You are the. And if you don't bear fruit, I what? So when you think about all of the theological lies and deceptions, that's why you treat your salvation recklessly. Well, God, you know, God, once saved, always saved. No, no, no. Once saved, always saved. Only if you stay among the saved. Right. Right. So to stay saved, you stay with. So this whole idea that you can swing with the unsaved and you can do what they do and all of those things. This whole idea, this notion came from a being that knows what God will kill, that knows what God will condemn and knows how to make people do it. This devil tells you everything he's doing. And you know what you say? Ha ha. That was thought provoking. That was stimulating and not, oh my goodness, I just got stabbed. When Satan does it, it's, it's like somebody walking past you and injecting you with poison with a hypodermic you can't see. Days later, weeks later, you suddenly feeling weaker. You're not yourself. You can't. And eventually you see yourself deteriorate. That's what sin is like. Sin is an injection in the redeemed that causes defection 
from the Redeemer. It's real. Now, you know, I understand we have people who, you know, we don't talk about sin. All you do is talk about sin. So does your computer. Your computer talks about sin all the time. That is invalid. That is corrupt. That is error. That's why God knows that humanity in this generation really does know why he's going to send them to hell. You need to be quarantined. You're in. Just go to all, all the communal, computer language, and you'll find it in your Bible. That's right. Because in the beginning was the word. Yeah. So you're gonna find all of the languages for hell in your computer book. It's gonna pop up. Unknown, foreign. You know. I got I got a notification on something on my phone yesterday that said that, you know, unstable behavior. Huh? That's new. I didn't I, I just dumped it. So all of those, they know behavior needs to be a certain way in order to function, to perform, to conform. They know it. So don't act like you don't know. Now, the people in the 80s and the 90s, maybe not so much. Although I was working for a communications company and they had all of this laid out. What we're living today, they had laid out. And so that may be the case. But don't act as if you, where God's not going to judge. Your computer does not judge you. It just won't perform or it just will evict you. Just bump you out. And if you don't, the upgrades that you get when you are born again, your computer gets upgrades and updates and you can't reverse them. You can only corrupt them. So technology has borne witness to the eternal word of God and does it every day in a man-made, handmade machine. Hmm. I just thought that was interesting. So these are our words, prophetology and prophetiatry. The spirit, soul, mind of the prophet and really the agents of the Godhead. Because you understand that the threefold are agents and the fivefold are representatives. Which means that there is a restriction of of the abilities and the privileges and the authority. So that is why, even though a local school doesn't want to teach the gay agenda, the Board of Education, threefold, ah. is mandating it and imposing it. And what does that mean? And putting punishments and penalties behind the, it so that those who refuse may be judged and may be penalized. See, we're, we, we haven't even wrapped our head around what the early church actually received from the apostles. Huh. We still have yet to learn what the uh, uh, ancient Israelis received from the prophets. We, we, we have a long way to go because we, you know, oh, what does the scripture say? Oh, how the mighty have fallen. We've fallen from grace because we started teaching other gods theology other deities, religions, because we did not thoroughly investigate the what the Holy Spirit actually brought to the planet and what God actually embedded and instilled in Moses. He said, God said, I will not have anybody, I'm not making anything like Moses ever again. Right. Now there are people had great intensities of this and this and this, but truth be told, I'm not making anything like Moses again. Ever. And he has it. And you know why? Because that was consummate. And so we don't know uh, anything that's like Moses until Jesus comes and then we find out he's Moses' maker. So how, how much like Moses can he be if he made him? So the Lord your God will raise up. See, I don't care about these young prophets who all, all you can do is run around and do babble. Y'all Babylonian prophets because all you can do is babble. Babble, babble, babble. You're Babylonian prophets. Because it's Bible. We got cycle babble. And I'm going to add to the, the language of our era, prophet babble. 
That's just saying anything just because. And all you do is say. So I'm not impressed with that. I am not impressed with Babel because if you notice, Babel didn't keep the planet. But fed into its demise or its, its deterioration. Right. So we don't profit Babel here. And we don't profit lie. Because we have to know it. But that comes from the soul realm. And so you need to understand. So we're talking about prophetology under the study and the disciplines of the prophet. From the soul to the world. From the spirit to the soul, in fact. To the soul, to the mind, to the mind, to the world. Your brain is what gives everything to the world. And then we have prophetry because guess what? We need healing. We need disciplines. And I told you, I am scientizing the prophetic. I'm doing that because it's, it, it is a biotic, biologic, um, I want to say function, but it's more than a function. Makeup, constitution. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate him. You know, the Lord be listening. Okay. I thank you. It is the Jesus and Paula show. Every now and then Jesus just keeps on in and just keeps me moving. So this is constitutionally what we're talking about. The prophet's constitution. Constitution has something like 20 synonyms that we will dig into diagnostically, taxonomically, because we have a taxonomy for this. See, you can say all day long, well, you know, God, to, I'm just like her. You're not just like me because you don't even know how to put those words in the prophetic spirit. Yeah. Because you get mad if somebody said we're going to thank you for that word, prophet. That's and what we're going to hand that over to our class and we're going to diagnose your word. You get all nervous. You and I. And then you get defensive. Well, you can't diagnose, diagnose prophecy. If I can diagnose a sermon, uh -oh. if I can diagnose a doctrine that's claiming to be from the mouth of God, the mind of God, I can diagnose prophecy. So I'm taking, um, we're, we're, we're obliterating that particular pushback. We can diagnose, if it's God's word, and we're supposed to try it by the spirit of God, try it by the word of God, then why is it that we can't diagnose it when it's verbalized through one called a prophet? That's because, you know why you don't believe that? Because you actually believe that the prophetic, the sum of the prophetic is prediction and future telling. So you're saying, well, you can't diagnose the word. Well, you can't you can't say whether or not I got it from God. Yes, I can. Let me tell you something. We are we, even today. We can listen to the, the graduates of Ivy League schools and tell you where they came from. True. We can listen to MIT graduates. We can listen to Harvard graduates. We can listen to to Johns Hopkins graduates. We can listen to I'm telling you if we can do that, that means that they have eternalized and become the institution's academic and educational bent and product. Because education is to produce a product and for the prophetic that or education period, that product is people who create a society that embodies a culture because of a particular consciousness. So you can't tell me I can't say that you're not a prophet because it can. Because when you study a subject thoroughly enough, the, 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 that thing begins to congeal and it begins to gravitate toward each other to produce a product. How do we know that? What is the example of that in scripture? Ezekiel 37. As I prophesied, yeah, yeah. the bones came together. See, because prophecy is magnetic. It's, it has its own gravitational pull from creation. Mm. She said, hold it. So I'm, on, I'm going to sip something. I have to give her breathing room. She, she, got, she, she smokes over here. She goes, go steam. Nah. That's true. 
That is how prophecy and the mantle of the prophet mobilizes and actionizes creation's fragmented, distributed properties. We're going to show you how that's done. Like they need mag they need magic to hack it because they don't have it. We don't have to hack creation because we are it. As he is so are we. in this world. We are it. Because we're made from the dust of the ground, but when God, when Jesus redeemed us after the dust was destroyed. And, and, and totally um, corrupted by the serpents and Adam's corrupt seed now returning to it. The new spirit in us, in the wow. new creation from the last Adam put back in us, not just what was Adam. I don't ever teach that it takes us back to the garden because actually we were made in the garden. We were embodied in the garden. We were made in Christ. I don't know about you, but that's some good stuff. Yeah. That's the stuff that makes us better. That's the stuff that makes us greater. God literally switched out, as I've said before, our software so that we now have the exact genetic and geneal genealogical tree and, and, and gene structure, DNA, as a Godhead. We actually are born again to receive the Godhead's DNA. And to rep reproduce it in the world through the gospel. So the matrix part of the DNA. From the wife of God. From the mother of God. From the Holy Ghost. The feminine side of the Holy Spirit. That matrical part. Is what we pass on. Through gospel. Doctrine. Through teaching. Through prayer. Through intercession. Through casting out devils. Through discipleship. All of that is the matrical part, not matriarchal, matrical. So I have to say it correctly so you'll understand. So you're going to learn this in the class. So this is who we are, Pro prophetology and prophetry. Now, I know you, you all are used to buzzwords. Y'all like to snatch a word and whether you know what it means or not or how to explain, y'all just snatch it because it sounds good over the mic. But I tell you what, you'll be embarrassed for not going the distance. So here we are. We've been talking about this by a prophet, Hosea 12, 13, by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt and by a prophet, he was guarded, preserved, saved, redeemed, protected. Look at all the synonyms. So God starts everything with a prophet, but in God's realm, he keeps it through his prophets. So when the prophets lose their grip or relinquish or they defect, then what God has started begins to decompose. So because they deconstitute it. We've talked about this prophecy wisdom, and we're talking about this again, what a, what a clinic means. Because you think you know, so you watch. I'm telling you, by next year, we're going to have prophecy clinics all over the place. And I don't mind, but would you take the time to get good at it? Would you take the time to know what you're doing? Would you take the time to learn instead of just imitate? Because imitation does not give you an exact equation. Because you can only imitate what you see. You reproduce what you know and have become. Reproduction is not the same as imitation. So we look at it. So clinic, university, we are Price University. Seminar, some of these will be seminar classes. Uh, specialized ed education, we just talked about the specialized education. The soul is the maker made it. And then place of concentrated study, focused examination, consultation, of course, the institutional piece, institution. And then I want to go here. Practicum, conference for group instruction, workshop, examination, faculty. We're going to come back to faculty in just about a minute. A, a, and it could be a teaching hospital. This will be a hospital for souls. We are creating the Souls Hospital. Solico Hospital. We're going to get you out of Soul Hospice oh, into Soul Hospital. We're going to get your soul out of hospice. 
Okay. Now, moving to the next one, we're going to do case study. We're going to do a lot of analytical reviews. A lot of. And look at all of the things. These are things that they tell you you don't need to know to be a prophet. And yet God gave Moses all of this. Right. He gave Daniel all of this. He gave Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha all of this. And they kept the nation even in the most difficult times. And he backed up that knowledge with physical power, with human power. We still don't know what Elijah did to just teleport. Y'all all excited about the, the Avengers. I'm like, are you kidding? The man said that. He said, see, I'm telling you, I'm going to come. And as soon as I come to church, you're going to be gone. He, t he went wherever he went. What did he do to give uh, Philip to travel? Right. On the winds of the Holy Ghost, riding the Jesus train. The Jesus. They trying to kill Jesus and he said he hid himself. Now, I, and you know, you have theologians who are so well, you know, because to the natural mind, things are natural. Right. And the natural mind receive not the things of the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. The natural man doesn't person. So, I, I, again, we're not wasting time trying to persuade you. Because we don't have the time to waste. We should have done that 20 years ago. <laughs> we dropped the ball on it. We didn't do it. So now we have to run with who's running. If, you, if you're running with us, run on. Come on, we're going to run on and you're going to do it. We're not having a whole bunch of what so-and-so taught and what this one taught and all of that. But somehow or another, the ability to, to transport yourself, you know, air, talk, about, talk about new meaning to air travel, all right? <laughs> to travel by God's air is innate to the people that he knows he can trust. When I do my 40-day Dunamite class, we're going to dig into that. I'm hoping we'll dig into it because, you know, I'm, I'm pressing Jesus now. Like, okay, so Almighty, you got me out there. Well, there. Got my mouth out there. <laughs> so you got to be there, right? Yeah. But I don't doubt him. He wants it. It'll happen. But there are things that you don't know about the spirit of God. There are attributes and there are powers and, and abilities that, have, that, were, that were shut down by humanism and shut down by demonism because faith was transferred from God and Jesus to devils and darkness. And we transferred that faith by, by allowing Satan to sow disgruntledness, unbelief, and, and disenchantment in God's people. How did he get Eve to fall? Did God really say? That's right. Did God really say? And she's talking like God spoke to her directly, and he didn't. She disobeyed her husband, which is why nothing happened. Ooh. He disobeyed his God, and all hell broke loose. You need to know that. Hmm. Because you need to, and people keep saying, well, I don't understand. You know, and it's like, but... Eve was deceived. Yes. Adam defected. He, he literally turned his faith from his maker to, his, to God's adversary. And he did it because whatever happened to Eve when she ate had to be more than just ethereal or abstract. It had to be physical. A corruption had to happen. A severance between them had to happen because the glory on her dissipated. So he's looking at her now as he's never seen her before. And he's not feeling her any longer. He doesn't feel her presence in him because the connection is severed. And he realizes, wow, I'll be like I was before I named all the animals or after I named all the animals. I'll be like that. There'll be no helper meet me. Mm. Wisdom is the principal thing. I always have a class on biblical uh, prophetic slash prophetic ed called uh, the five prophecies that are still ruling the world. 
There are five prophecies in Genesis that are still ruling the world. So when we look at all of these things, how can you have a discussion? So when somebody argues with you and they say, yeah, but you want to you mean to tell me that God made the whole world in six days? And you're like, well, the Bible says so. But you didn't go to chapter two. Right. Because he made it in six days. Now, however long it took for him to embody it right. is not mentioned. See, and we don't distinguish that. Again, when you look at it, Adam's body was made after the seventh day. And I have people who said, you know, I even had a guy wrote me, you know, I'm, I, I really take issue with your seven day, seventh day, or, excuse me, eighth day embodiment because, and he ran down and I said, but if God said he hallowed the seventh day and made it Sabbath, then Sabbath for God was the end of his works, which means it was the end of his work week. And you see it show up again in the book of Acts when they talk about the Sabbath being Saturday and Sunday being the first day of the week. See how this is. So the scripture, but but you can't take a piece of scripture here and a drop there and a sliver over there and think you're going to get this, the, the whole truth. But we can't, in our class, our people can, dis, our kids can discuss it. Our kids can convert. You're sending kids out to evangelize with Jesus love you. This I know. And these kids are saying, but Allah loves us. Buddha loves us. Krishna, Shiva loves us. We, I mean, come on, they love us. So how are you going to make a difference? You can't even explain that. And so we wonder why right now people would rather hear from anything but Jesus Christ and his children. But not me. They're looking for what I have to say. Because I am not painting a picture of Asiatic faith lacquered with Christian vernacular. See, because we got a lot of lacquered Christians. That's why we got hybrid Christians, right. Buddhist Christians. It's true. Okay, Chrislam. What is that? That's why God never called us Christians. Because you could tell that by how easily people append themselves to it and annex them to a faith that, that predates their God's existence. Are y'all still with me? So let we look at just looking at some of the things, analytical review, case study, practical case examination. We're doing that in our in our uh, the five prophecies that rule the world. Thematic analysis, thematic analysis. Do you understand thematic? That means that that comes from theme. That means it's a theme that keeps actionizing itself and actionizing itself and actionizing itself each time requiring a higher or more in-depth analysis. Uh, consequential study for judging. I like that one. Consequential study for judging. Can you imagine? We have to study consequences, which means precedence is important to judge. So we have much more. We'll get into this. Um, but I like under case study. You should be able to see it. I'll read it out loud. Explore autopsy diagnose. Right now, the biggest deal, the latest thing that I've been following is, you know, Google now is trying to set science up as a collective God. And so every day, the scientists have done something new. First of all, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. And secondly, we still have to take their word for it. Because we still got to deal with egotistical people who will take this. I mean, we still, we're talking about, five, and I don't have a problem with science because I like science. I do. I think it, I like it, but I do know that it is not impervious or immune to deception, to hastiness, to irrationality, to self-serving. It is not. So let's not act as if they did, because remember, it was science that gave us Roe v. Wade, which when you read it, you don't even, you know, science couldn't have touched it <laughs> or either the science wasn't ready to touch, touch it. Now, so. 
now they're doing this. So they had one, they, the newest thing is that they're unearthing all of these human body parts, supposedly proving evolution. Um, and so, you know, we found this leg, this ear, this corpse, this, this, and showing that trying to say humans evolved. So, you know, my thought on this thing is, first of all, and even dealing with some of their, um, their what they say are how they die, I'll say that. So my thought is, but when God had the flood, remember the flood, the flood. that every religion has to acknowledge. They do. Then God had the flood and all humanity died. All of those body parts remained in the earth from the flood. After the flood, the earth is, awa is washed away. It's completely void of any nutrients. So we, we could not go and get our little beet for our iron. You couldn't go and get to, come on, let's act like we know it, our little greens for our vitamin C. They were not only that, but they were also corrupted by all of the dead animals yeah. that decomposed in the flood and after the flood. Is anybody getting the point? So humanity became severely malnourished still reproducing but reproducing deformed versions yeah. of what predated the flood mm. so we have no idea what kind of babies were being born conceived we're looking at, at when we look at the at, at the east and some of those deformities you're like whoa and that's in 2022 AD. So from the flood all the way up to what, whatever, that flood literally poisoned and degenerated the human seed, the human genome. It would have had to because it does today. I mean, we who live in a, uh, you know, a highly developed country still walk around. If we don't eat a certain whatever, let's say we don't get enough vitamin C, we still get rickets, scurvy, yep. bone diseases. So imagine the entire planet with every tree was gone, every, all of that, and all of this dead animals and all of the, just think about it. And now imagine only eight people have to repopulate it. Eight people are going to repopulate it and they're the only ones whose genes were not made part of that global burial ground the Lord created. He in fact had a global funeral. First he had global slaughter and then global funeral. I mean, the fact that he, True. see, we, we, yeah. this is what I mean when I say case examination, we have to examine these cases and we have to apply the wisdom that we have today that wasn't available, although their wisdom was superb because they were all bound by devils. Devils were in the schools. Devils were teachers. We think this is something new. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now imagine this mother nursing these children off of the ground that is barren, utterly depleted of everything. Is this speaking to you? So here we are, fast forward, millennia later, we get to see the perversions. And we call it evolution or devolution because we evolved. See, some, with God, things are practical. Now, remember, they had also married with demons. They had reproduced after demons. So that demonic infiltration of the human genome would have shown up in the physiological structure. When you read uh, Primordial Enoch, they talk about how the, their babies were born so fast because they grew fast. 
And so by four months, they had kids. Now, how true that is, I don't know. Because, you know, I do know the devils pervert everything. But we have to know that they get, if they gave birth to giants, then you're going to have giant bones. If they gave birth to very macabre, very perverse looking, deformed fetuses or infants, guess what? They're going to look like, they're not going to look like us. Because even if we go back to the, the last couple of hundred years of the B.C. age before Christ, meaning before the Holy Ghost, because see, people think B.C., well, we just call it before counting eras. No, no, no. Y'all were dying. <laughs> and your God couldn't feed you. Had you in a bush, had you in a brush. No scientific anything. But. If you go back to that, look at them. When they study, they say, well, they had this disease and that disease. Where did it come from? Diseases come from the earth before science. Since science, they come from the earth manipulated by humans in a lab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But before science, a disease was really a disease. A virus was really a virus. Huh. True. And so, and passing things on was genuine. So I need you to understand that's some of the stuff that prophets ought to be able to sit down and talk about instead of who's got how many members, how many folks, how many cars you have, how many, how much your shoes cost. You out there by making up a line of sleazy clothes instead of trying to tell people how they're going to survive the fruit of that sleaze. You can tell where they are. You can tell they're not with God. They're not trying to help God's people grow up. They're not trying to arm you and equip you for what's to come. They're acting like the world that blessed them is going to last forever. I'm just saying. So you're going to love this part. Spirit, uh, a prophetic assessment of spiritual faculties versus anointing. Next week, I will uh, bring you lay the word clouds for faculty against anointing so you can understand why we haven't developed you. We should develop you a lot more, and we will. Now, in my assessment, I have, uh, I think I've mentioned we have 12 types of profit, which is really interesting that we do. Now, and they actually cover what, what we would call the entire prophet's office spectrum. So we have a category, case in point, getting you to think differently. Um, my whole push, my entire objective is to get you to think differently, to live powerfully on God's power, to get the body of Christ back on God's power grid. How about it? Because we're off his grid. So there's a category in our um, explanations for all of the prophets, and it's, uh, it reads, how you presently recognize God's ministry functions and forecast their impact on the future. How you presently recognize God's ministry and forecast what? Ministry, I'm sorry, functions and, and forecast their impact on the future. These people cannot tell you what the future holds for real. Because they don't want to examine the present enough to be accurate or specific. And so what does that mean? It locates where respondent, talking about a sesi, where respondent currently functions in ministry in contrast to what his or her gifts and talents indicate is God's true call and eventual use on his kingdom staff. Do you think like that? As a minister, do you think like that? As a, or do you just go with the anointing? You just, you, I'll just lump it under the, the word anointing. Okay, and then we, we also, and I've mentioned this before, we break it down to explanations of grades and phases. And phases pertain to giftings and manifestations ranking only. Grades pertain to office rankings. So your phase, like when we talk to our prophets, I know that because my team has done this for, well, I don't even know. How many years have you all done the advisor thing? Since 2008. Since 2008. So you realize that they're over a decade. It takes at least 10 years to be a specialist. So 
when we talk about phases, that means from the moment that anything prophetically enlivens itself in you to how it increases and intensifies and under the conditions and exertions that cause it to do so. When we talk about the grades pertaining to the office, we're talking about how your growth, your maturity, and your development responds to, accommodates, and adapts to this eternal office that predates you. Mm. So it's about how you fit in. So you can say, I work for a hundred year company and everybody's excited. Yeah, you work for a hundred year company and three months later they fire you because you don't adapt. You don't fit in. You refuse to do it. You want to change everything because you're on the scene. So phase one, you're just waking up. Hey, I think something spiritual is happening. Something different is happening. Phase two, you have some exposure because you like try to explore what's going on with phase one. Phase three, you're moving from exploration to study. And you're now we're, that study is speaking to and, and enveloping or enveloping your gifts, your talents and the attributes. And so they're focused on your gifts. Most prophets are phase three. Because you're locked into futurism. Um, phase four, that means that you've been been having some significant practice, enough significant practice for, for you to have your gift exercised and develop in and, and it is in whatever your area is. So if you're a militaristic prophet, kind of like what we have with uh, Prophet CT, then you're going to show that no matter what, that Joshua thing is working in you, that Joshua consciousness and mindset. I think it's very interesting that Moses, M Moses had Joshua and then Jesus comes as Yeshua, Joshua a form of okay five is that you have moved from gift to office but and that you are very progressive in your operations and exercise of your gifts and talents as they were endowed by god but now endowment is being upgraded with endowment then let's look at the grade grade one you're ready for early studies remember you're just waking up i need to find out what's going on i i don't even know um a grade two, you're ready for some low level intermediate studies, but you can actually still have proven yourself to be a prophet because you may just be an intercessor or we're now exploring whether you are to be established as an intercessor, which is our beginning result, established as an intercessor uh, or are you an, a, a low level prophet or are you a destined prophesier? where your gift has locked in on its predetermined, preordained level and contact and capacitance. So then grade three means you're ready to practice. Now, most times, most prophets are grade three, which is the apprentice level. Why? Because you're still calling yourself a gift. I mean, you can't even get mad with us. You're calling yourself a gift and you can't tell us what institution has made you an office. So there we are. And then we have, so we, some, at that point, you should be looking to attach yourself to a seasoned and veteran version of yourself. Grade four, you're ready for advanced learning or early practice in your particular area. So you're now moving past the threshold of apprenticeship to professional. Now, because the church likes to just snatch words and terms, you probably will say, well, then I'm a professional because your ego is predestining you. <laughs> and in grade five is the advanced, that is your master, etc. So let's look at this. This is really important. Hold on. I don't know where the other one is. Okay, but a, fa a faculty, look at this. A faculty is an inherent or acquired attribute. It is a resource that evidences itself through special abilities. Now, if it's evidence, that means it's seen, it's observable, it's detectable, and it goes from detectable to observable. So we don't, you all don't look for it. Like you don't look for the other stuff. I used to say to her, I said, wow, Ashley, that's new. When did you start doing that? She's like, I don't know. I just do it. 
Why? I know that God has upgraded her, that he's downloaded something. I used to say to Chief, when she starts talking, wait a minute, hold on. When did, when did that show up? If your mentor is truly a mentor, we ought to tell you what's showing up. We ought to tell you that it's part of your mentorship. It's part of your prophet spirit. It's, it's, it's updating your endowments to endowment. I'm supposed to be able to say that. That's why we jokingly call Ashley, Apostle Ashley, Kronos. Because this girl and timing is unbelievable. And then we have other ones when we talk about uh, Prophet Angela. I was like, oh, wait a minute. But she has that ability to turn and to uh, academize what is information that pertains to the prophet. We're supposed to do that. Your mentor not, is not doing it. Then you have a mentor that is too close to you and attributes and ability and scape, scope and attention. Faculties exist to en enable and empower action, work, or occupation, not to display your gift. It's, uh, so your faculties are not about your display. It's not, you know, you go into the store. I love this display. Isn't this a wonderful display? Christmas time, you see amazing displays. You can't buy them. You can't use them. They're there for sure. They're for sure. Now, if you want that, you can be guided by that, but you have to get the real deal. And it has to be active and alive. So you're going to get an appliance. We're going to either sell you the box with the picture or the housing of the appliance or the whole thing if you want it to work. So I need you to catch that. Faculties particularize the powers of the mind and its inherent and acquired cognition. You, if you have to keep saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, nobody told me, nobody said, then that means A, your, your training system is deficient, your learning is deficient, and that translation from theory to practice is that connection has not yet been forged. We're almost done because I'll pick this up next week. Your faculties tend to ha heighten a knack or skill that you've always had. You've always been able to figure out things. If you're a mathematician, the prophetic is going to make you a higher, more abstract, as well as, in fact, mathematician. You're, you're going to understand things in ways that it's going to take you 10 weeks to, to explain to people. Mental faculties capacitate exceptional memory, reason, or speed, or other powers of the mind to perform or act. So your mental faculties should not be a ball of confusion. And you should not, if you're, caught, if you're in that thing. Now this is talking about, now we're talking about phases one to four. So when, when I tell you that, and, and, and so people, because you know, people will always say, well, who are you? You can't tell me what God doesn't say. Yes, I can. Moses told them what God said. Moses had all day sessions telling people he was an all day personnel agency, right. family council, government advisor, and constitutional consultant. He did that according to Genesis 18, I mean, Exodus 18. So you, you've been told that because you privatize it, all right. that we cannot identify it. But again, there's nothing new under the sun. A faculty is an aptitude that facilitates expertise in a field by strengthening abilities, enlarging capacity to generate prosperity, wealth, and success. That is why believe his prophets, so shall you prosper is there. That means that there is a unique fa faculty that comes with the prophet spirit that not only speaks to, but demands creation to generate its best and not just its marginal. Now you, you have to own these because we can't force you. Right. You have to own them. And I tell you, I started with my prophetic team. They could not tell me what they couldn't afford. I never listened to them. I was like, then you're not a prophet, right? Well, I'm still, a, I, no, no, no. I told them, go get it. Send your mantle out to get it. Send your faith out to get it. And you know they did? They came back with a lot more. All that you see, 
This is not just my mantle. This is their mantle buying into the power and the faculties, the invisible, magnetic, gravitational faculties of creation and telling them, diverting them from where they're going to here. Telling them, you turn, come back, here it is. And, and how does it show up? It showed up in jobs. It showed up in opportunities. They would get, she'd get, well, we, we're doing a movie. We want you to be an extra. We want you to be part of the cast. They would show up in people's sewing. They'd show up your mantle. If you're really an office occupant or office dedicated, you want to be able to bring it in. And the problem is the enemy knows it. So he makes you frustrated, scared, panicked, and depressed before you go back and call your mantle back online. So he suppresses it with your thoughts of your negative thoughts. We all have to fight them. So you can sit there and say, I'm a prophet and I can't put my kids in an apartment. I'm telling you, you have missed your calling. You might need to go over someplace else. You need to be in helps ministry. You can't get a job. You can't keep a job and you're a prophet. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? We're supposed to give other people jobs. That is our job. My job is to give you a job. See how that works out. So you can't raise your own anything. And yet you want us to believe that you have power with God to do it for others, to cause others to prosper where you can't make yourself prosperous. You can't generate your own Play-Doh, your own record. No, but you need training because it doesn't happen because you heard it. It happens because you've become it. And it's the becoming thing that causes people to quit too soon. They quit right at becoming because they want it to be something that they, a candy machine. Let me tell you, a real prophet, you can't get your thing through. Let me tell you about a real prophet. A real prophet is going to walk that floor and they're going to fight. They don't walk it in the daytime. They walk it when the witches are praying. They walk it when the devils are moving. They walk it when the potions are being whipped up. They're walking that floor. They're neutralizing. They're canceling out. They're neutralizing. They're canceling out and they're canceling out and they're doing it until it turns around. They change staff. Okay, so this particular funder doesn't like me, but you are sitting in the seat I need. I'm putting you on vacation by the Holy Ghost so that your temp will pass me through. See, there is, see, that's why you need school. See, that's why you need it. Not because as luck would have it. Prophets can't deal with luck because luck is a false spirit of, of prosperity. It's a false fortune. Because that means that devil is going to lend it, but it's not going to be yours. But they said, but the, the what? The Lord makes rich and adds what? No so you lack because you stand back. You lack because you will not work. You lack because you like lack because it's more comfortable to whine and complain than it is to rise up in your seat and tell this thing. Because you have to know you have an inheritance. You have to know that you have a what? You've got to live it every day. Every day. Now, there are days you're going to slip down and whatever, but God covers you when you're slipping. But he's going to let you slide if you don't want to get up. Yeah. That's the mantleship of the office. And don't let you hook up with two, three others. As mine started hooking up with each other, I was like, ooh. And they would call me, Dr. Price, this is what happened here. Because I taught them, don't take anything for granted. Don't demean your blessings. Don't dismiss them. No, no. Recognize that this is a faculty at work. Your prophet's mantle went out and did this or did that. And I'm telling you, I'm here today because my team said we are breaking the veil of silence on your ministry. We are not doing. No, that's not going to happen. We are here today. They prayed this in as much as I did. And we prayed together. But we didn't just say, Father, please. We went over to we already took Father is pleased. That's why we have the opportunity. So let's go over here to the obstructions. Last one. Outstanding faculties attract privilege, position, status, power, and authority conferred by government, enterprise, institutions, and their superiors. If you are selling your work, you will not stand before what? Insignificant people. 
But our mantle is our work and our resource. It's our workplace and work tools, our toolkit and all of those things. And we do, we think it differently. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the only reason that you, people have been sliding without this is because the body has been naive and uneducated in what to expect. So they accept anything foreign, anything alien, anything unfamiliar as God. But as the body of Christ becomes educated, these shenanigans, these child play, kinder, prophetics, ending. Yeah. Well, it's time. For you to sow, I have sown, I have pushed, and let me tell you something. You cannot retrieve from God's realm what you've not deposited in it. If you're in debt to him and your tithes, you probably want to pay up, pay him up because you need him to do something bigger. And I'll tell you this. This is important. The prophets already, our mantles are built in to know where God wants to release what. We have the levers, the knobs, and all of that in our mouth. So um, when we did the prayer thing with Prophet Tamir, I wasn't supposed to be there that night. I popped in. Oh, yes. I told her last minute, and I popped in. And when I sat down, God had me call out people who had been faithful to him. Yeah. So you think we play favorites. I didn't know any of those people. I called them out over the Internet and told them what God said. Why? They have been faithful. And they had or they had the inclination to be faithful if we released their funds and their harvest. And I prophesied to about five or six people, maybe four or five people, and they did not know it. One man, my uh, chief prophet said she had just counseled him about what I said. I knew nothing. But God knows. So you can say all day long. Well, when God blesses me, God is like, well, when you bless me. Huh. Well, I'll sow to God when God releases my son. So God said, well, I'll release your soul. And so when you sow to me, because God is not looking for your cash or your currency. He's looking for your care, for his duties and responsibilities and your commitment to seeing to it that you finance his ob obligations to his people and his objectives for his ventures because you finance Satan, but now you need to finance God. The reason the world has, the church is broke is because they started financing darkness instead of light. You started paying for Satan's visions, the movies, the theaters, the, uh, the, the labs, you pay for all of those things that will just, uh, that are geared up to destroy your God. And then you want God to bless you. Oh, I'm going to talk to you about this again. Well, we're going to walk this walk again. You have no idea how financing darkness bankrupt your God and his, his, his church and his duty. You bankrupt the Holy Ghost. And now you're upset because you got to file bankruptcy. Because you owe him. And you didn't tend to do it. You listened to some preacher that told you, don't be giving it to a church because a church will waste your money. So a devil that is, you paying for a company that's into sex trafficking. You don't know it, but you're into it. You're paying for meth labs. You're paying for cannabis shops. Because in your mind, you don't want to give it to a church. You'd rather give it to a devil. You'd rather give it to a destroyer. You'd rather Think about all of the things that has thrown up as the church's wealth has shrunk. You're doing something with your money. You're paying for wicked programming and lousy movies and all of those kinds of things so that even God's ability to solve it and counteract it has been depleted because you sent your money to build it and to aid it. You didn't mean it. I know you didn't mean it because a lot of stuff I did, I was like, God, what was I thinking? And then I said, well, I wasn't thinking clearly. But now that you know better, do better. Go catch up your tides. Send the offerings, and since I'm the one that's laboring like this for you, you need to be sending it to me at that location on the screen. But when you do, as you said, I want you to get on your knees, and I want you to pray. And this is what I want to hear you say to God. He wants to hear you say, Dear Father God, I had no idea. My heart is for you. My heart is for your best. But when I went to my counselor, my counselor dissuaded me from doing this. When I went to my financial counsel, that he told me I can't do this. When I went to my funder, and, and Lord, I didn't know any better. I'm asking you to forgive me, and I'm giving you this seed and this harvest. 
as reparations and penance for my misunderstanding of darkness's attack on you and assault on your economies. I'm asking you to forgive me, Father God, and I'm asking you to trust me one more time. And if you trust me one more time, I will be faithful, God. And I will not withhold your portion and your measure again. And you thank him, and then you sow it where he tells you to sow it. And every time you sow, you say the prayer, this is my second time. This is my second opportunity to prove to God that I can be felt faithful with his finances. And every time you sow, you say, God, I do this in declaration of faithfulness to your economy, faithfulness to your finances, faithfulness to your needs, to your treasury. <laughs> in Jesus name. Hey, share, 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 share. After you share, share some more, some more and sow your seed to me. Do not divert, divert my harvest to someone who failed him. Don't divert my reward to, to the wrong people. Right. Don't, 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 don't sow according to your sentiments and your emotions. Sow according to obedience and righteousness. I love you. We see you next time on the Jesus and Paula show. Join us if you're in the Tulsa area. Join us at the embassy, home of the congregation of the mighty where God stands. And when you come in, let us know. I, I came from the Jesus and Paula show. I came because I listened to your broadcast. You, If you're in town, bring your seed to the house and get it prayed over personally. God bless you. Introducing Soul Call Fridays with Dr. Price. Taking your soul from distress to success. One person at a time. Tune in every Friday on Facebook or YouTube.